for the work in the Monk in Sudan, for the notre conférencier aujourd'hui, vous êtes le bienvenu. Merci d'être venu. Um, this um, Manuel Lafon Rapanui is going to address us this afternoon on an important subject really in Europe today, and that is globalization, which has been questioned more and more, and indeed a good deal in France, as you have seen and witnessed from the events there, but elsewhere that people have lost out. It has left people uh, not able to manage, and uh, that uh, something needs to be done. And of course, the argument is to retrench again, but that's not acceptable in this world, of course. Uh, and of course, populism has, and uh, those parties who specialize in populism have benefited from the maximum. Uh, Manuel is very qualified. He is a senior fellow at the Paris Office of the European Council on Foreign Relations, and he's had uh, an interesting career, even though he's young, uh, in, in my books, <laughs> um, uh, an interesting career with the Fre French uh, diplomatic service, and he was a visiting fellow at the Centre for Strategic and International Studies, a Washington-based think tank. So uh, I would ask you to switch off your, I left this as a reminder to myself, to switch off your mobiles remind you that uh, the main part of the proceedings are uh, on the record, but the question and answer session is chatter rules, in other words, off the record. Uh, so, uh, without further ado, Daniel, you have about half an hour or so. Yes, thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to the, to the discussion. You will see that I will open much uh, more doors than I will uh, close. Uh, and uh, partly because they are quite dif difficult to close. Uh, so I'm looking forward to discussions and, and reactions. Uh, but first, if, if you made a bet on how long it will take before I mention uh, President Trump, uh, you've lost, <laughs> because um, I will start with <coughs> a statement last September at the UN General Assembly, which actually was uh, precisely um, an attack against globalism, and, and that's the word he used. And it's not just the traditional issues that successive US administrations have had with multilateralism. We all know that uh, at least since the end of the Cold War, it's been a la carte multilateralism, as uh, Richard Haas uh, said in 2001. Uh, and that's very much the case for this administration, which has, for instance, in the first phase of its dealing with the uh, uh, proliferation crisis in North Korea, has insisted on UN and UN Security Council cooperation to put pressure both on North Korea and on China. Uh, so you have sometimes, uh, most of the time, a policy which is multilateral when we can, unilateral when we must, uh, which was Madame O'Brien's phrase. Uh, actually, less often, but it may happen, you have the reverse, unilateral as soon as we can, multilateral only if we must. But I think that Trump is different uh, from, from that. It's not just the issues that this specific administration, the Trump administration, has with the UN, and yet there are many uh, issues. I would just remind you quickly of the fact that under Trump, the US withdrew from the Paris Agreement on Climate, from the Iran nuclear deal, uh, decided that it will not sit anymore at the Human Rights Council, uh, withdrew from the Universal Postal Union. Uh, you maybe didn't know about uh, that specific organization, which is one of the oldest multilateral organizations, uh, and quite important if you work uh, in, in male uh, affairs. It withdrew from the list of funders from the UN Relief and Work Agency, which is the agency that works in support to Palestinian refugees, etc., etc., but the, the reproach from the statement were much broader and deeper than that. And what Trump said when he criticized and attacked globalism is that the major threat for the US right now, the major threats, threats 
as he sees it, is a threat to US sovereignty, and that threat comes from, quote, global governance, and, quote again, new forms of coercion and domination that has to do with international institutions and international uh, rules. So what, what is it um, that this means, and what, what is it that this means, especially for Europe, is uh, something that I believe is very important for us to, to realize. And I think it's, this approach is a particular problem for Europe for at least three reasons. Um, to start with, uh, it's a problem because of the importance of transatlantic relations, obviously. We have a problem when we diverge on substance. Uh, that's the case on climate. We don't agree on the fact that there is a problem and we need to tackle it. There is a problem when we diverge on strategy and tactics. That's also a uh, uh, an issue. Um, for instance, on trade with China, I would argue uh, that the US and the EU basically share the same reproaches against the Chinese, that they have the same uh, economic interests uh, at stake, or at least very similar interests. Uh, and yet, the Trump administration has decided to deal with this issue from outside the WTO framework, whereas the European preference uh, would be to deal with it through uh, the WTO uh, framework. But that's even more of a problem when it leads to uh, doubts on the nature of our relations, for instance, on security, obviously. Is NATO still a uh, security an alliance, meaning an alliance uh, based on the idea that there's a commonality of security interests at stake? Or is it an organization based on the fact that uh, there are burden sharings and that the Europeans should pay for a US security guarantee. And obviously you don't believe the same way, you don't trust security guarantees the same way when you think it's based on commonality of threat assessment and threat perception and commonality of security interest or when it's based just on how much you pay to the common uh, uh, um, budget or to your, to your security guarantor budget. Uh, and obviously, uh, it's even worse when you have some degree of confrontation, and I think that's uh, very much the case uh, with Iran secondary sanctions, where, um, for instance, on climate, the US said, we'll get out of the deal, but let's basically, we agree to disagree. Uh, we go out of the deal, and therefore, we don't follow these uh, uh, rules and commitments that we see as constraints but you do whatever you want to do. It's your problem, it will constrain you, we don't care about that, would be the US approach to that. On Iran, it's not just that, it's not only we get out of the deal, but we don't want you to do what you should be doing uh, within the framework of the deal. And therefore, we'll take sanctions not just against Iran, but also against European actors who want to have economic relations with Iran, because we want you to align your foreign policy on ours. And that's a very coercive and quite different uh, approach. So that's the first problem. The second problem for Europe with this uh, uh, approach uh, uh, from the US administration of multilateral uh, uh, cooperation is because we know that what the US is doing is very much a short-term strategy. And that um, opens, uh, uh, leaves uh, intact quite a few problems. We just discussed with a few of you uh, the fact that the US attitude in the UN system is creating a vacuum, and that uh, this vacuum opened the risk that the UN is handed over to China. Uh, it wasn't the case in 2002, 2003, when there was the Iraq crisis, that China was able to actually take advantage of uh, uh, US uh, policy. Uh, certainly now China is in a much better position to actually uh, um, exert and increase its influence in the UN system uh, much more uh, than it was uh, uh, 15 years ago, and, and much more than it would be if the US was uh, still quite active and committed to, to the UN system. There's also the risk that non-cooperative policies uh, usually make the problem bigger mm -hmm. when the problem have to do uh, basically are non-zero sum game uh, and have to do with global public goods, so migration, biodiversity, you name it, uh, you have just this idea that non-cooperative policies kick the can further down the road, but it's not just that it kicks it further down the road, it's that in between the can gets bigger. 
Uh, and the third risk, even from the US perspective, uh, you have the risk that your bilateral solution, your bilateral issues does not really uh, serve all of your interests. If the US is able to get a good bilateral deed on trade or on economic and financial relations in general with China, it leaves the problems of uh, US and China competition in other markets intact. Uh, what happens to uh, US and China competing in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Latin America, in the rest of Asia and the Pacific, and obviously in Europe? That's why uh, you have a World Trade Organization, and that's why before the WTO you add efforts to put in place multilateral framework for trade. And last, um, another problem for Europe, which clearly is not the least, uh, has to do with the fact that the EU is based on cooperation. And we are so much less at ease in an international environment which is not based on cooperation. It's not just that we have invested so much on multilateralism and in cooperative uh, uh, policies that we have more to lose than others from the, the, the uh, uh, undermining of cooperation and of this rules-based uh, order, but it's more than that. It's the fact that the EU is based on interdependence. It's built on the idea that not only is interdependence good, but on top of it, it will actually force us into more cooperation, which also is good. And we realize that not only uh, interdependence is not enough to force countries, even within the EU, into cooperation, but actually interdependence may be asymmetric. And when it's asymmetric, it can be leveraged by the side uh, which has the asymmetry in its favor. And that's what happens, for instance, in the relation between the EU and Turkey on migration. There's an asymmetry, and the asymmetry can be played by Turkey in its favor. You have that on cyber, you have that on, um, uh, on energy, and you have that on uh, economic and finance. And that's the very basis for uh, the, the power of US sanctions, not just with uh, smaller, less developed countries, but also uh, with the EU in spite of the size of its single market and the fact that it has a common uh, currency, etc., etc. And we Europeans are faced uh, with our very own challenges in this cooperation versus sovereignty uh, topic. So let me go precisely into this idea of uh, sovereignty and how the discussion about sovereignty uh, plays uh, in this context. One of the sources of this uh, uh, fight against globalism uh, policy uh, is the idea that a rules-based order, a rules-based world order, is providing false comfort at best and more likely uh, uh, is uh, imposing illegitimate and or dangerous constraints on your foreign policy. And that's one of the reasons why the US have withdrawn, for instance, from the INF Treaty. They don't like it because they think they are the good guys, so that's illegitimate to be constrained, and it's dangerous because uh, in the meantime, China is uh, developing uh, its own uh, intermediate nuclear capa capabilities, uh, which will have a big role in the stability and strategic stability of uh, the uh, uh, Asia and Pacific region. So it's not just that uh, Russia is cheating with the treaty, but it's also uh, that, on top of it, uh, you end up being the uh, good guy and yet being cheated by your partner and being uh, uh, disadvantaged uh, in another uh, terrain. But it's the same with WTO. It's not just that uh, the US wants to uh, have its own bilateral solution to the, the trade issues, uh, the pending trade issues with China, uh, and deal with that uh, bilaterally. But actually, the US policy right now on WTO is to undermine the dispute settlement uh, body. Um, so there is a sense that this body, which was seen when it was established as a progress, is actually uh, uh, putting constraints on uh, deals that the US would be able to get if it was a more kind of a um, uh, pure uh, uh, rapport de force, pure uh, balance of power uh, issue. And I'm not going to mention the ICC, uh, which I'm sure everybody has in mind, but I'm going to mention the uh, Marrakesh Pact on uh, Migration. And the reason why I uh, take that as an another example is that, unlike the ICC, the Marrakesh Pact on Migration uh, 
uh, compact on migration was interesting because uh, there were also EU member states voting against it at the UN and there were a bit more EU member states uh, uh, not endorsing the compacts uh, at the final uh, ceremony. So, you have this idea uh, uh, that this is about uh, uh, your sovereignty and, and, and preserving, safeguarding your sovereignty. And I think that the reason why it's mistaken is because it only look at one side of the coin. It's the idea that sovereignty is, and it is, obviously the authority to govern yourself. But that doesn't mean that it's unchecked power to act. The other side of the coin is that sovereignty is also the political and legal ability to interact with other states. So it's also about being politically and legally able to underwrite rules and to contribute to collective action. One of the key uh, uh, pillars of the idea of international uh, order for sovereign states is the principle of the sovereign equality of states, which means that there are boundaries to sovereignty, if only because of uh, other states' sovereignty. So you have, you have this uh, uh, issue, and this issue is all the more complex in a context where First, sovereignty is, at least in democratic societies, uh, also about uh, people's control. Uh, and <laughs> the issue being that uh, there's, it, it used to be that uh, people's control over foreign policy could be only remote, because what was at stake democratically on foreign policy was less direct uh, uh, than uh, many other public policies. The fact is, this is not the case anymore. You deal with foreign policy, that means you deal with trade. It means you deal with global pandemics. It means you deal with migration. You deal with refugees. You deal with terrorism. You deal with all these issues that people feel have a direct impact, not just on their lives in general, but on their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, it, it's not the case anymore that trade is this kind, the, 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 these kind of um, far and distant uh, issues. Uh, it, it really changes whether your children will have a job tomorrow uh, at the nearby factory or not. It's not just that it deals with uh, big issues, but it deals with uh, um, really what is going to happen to your uh, neighbors, to your cousins, to your family, to your friends, to your children. Uh, all the time. And, and this is something that you see populist movements much more aware than mainstream political parties. Uh, I have only a, a few examples, you can find uh, many others, but uh, you will remember I mentioned the Marrakesh Compact on Migration. The Belgian government fell over the issue of endorsing that pact uh, or not. Uh, and uh, in, uh, in Netherlands, you had a referendum on EU-Ukrainian uh, association agreement. It, it really seems weird that people would actually uh, sign a petition and ask for a referendum on this, but it was the case. It had enough signatures, a referendum was held, and it was negative. It was only consultative, so governments, the Dutch government could go ahead, and it did so after uh, asking its partners to uh, clarify a few points. Uh, but <coughs> this is something that we are not uh, used to, I, I believe. So this issue certainly is something for us Europeans. It's not just a multilateral issue, and I will now just quickly talk about European sovereignty. I know there is a problem with terminology. People say oh, the European sovereignty is a legal contradiction in terms. Some people say it's politically uh, very inflammable. Let's not uh, use uh, um, this word. You can't deprive, you can't give the impression that you're going to deprive nations from uh, so their sovereignty. But on substance, there is this uh, uh, different approach between people who have a more kind of purist or theological approach to uh, sovereignty and those who have a more pragmatic approach to it. And the, the key divide is how do you answer the question about is collective action the best option to weigh on world affairs and to be a rules maker and not a rules taker? And obviously the, the, those that I call theologists would say Yes, that's all very uh, good in theory, but just it doesn't work. Uh, and that's why we need to be able uh, to uh, stick to our own national sovereignty. And I will address that in a minute. But 
they don't answer the issue on how you weigh on world affairs and how you remain a rules maker, not a rules taker, if you uh, go on the international stage uh, just an, as an individual nation and how everyone can do that because that's the other difference. It's not just between pragmatism and more a, a, a theological approach to it, but it's also a difference between individual and collective approach. Collective action is the best tool to preserve people's sovereignty and equality. Obviously, uh, uh, it makes sense that Trump has this kind of approach when his motto is America first. But uh, all governments have to care for their country uh, uh, first, that's for sure. But first, uh, does it mean at the expense uh, of others? If you want to take into account the fact that uh, precisely you need that the system works for everyone, then you need to find a way to preserve people's sovereignty and equality, and not just uh, uh, their, uh, the idea that some people can be sovereign and the rest will have to be rules taken. Um, obviously, this is not easy from inside. There are many questions. How do you organize that? How do you, uh, what do you do when there is uh, uh, difficulty to reach consensus? Uh, that has to do with all the uh, current discussion in Europe about uh, uh, viable geometry or differentiated integration. How do you uh, share the burden? That's uh, very much uh, something that is discussed in NATO, but that uh, is also discussed uh, in, uh, in the EU. Uh, but if you look at from the outside, it's uh, much more pressing. Uh, that there is a need uh, to uh, work collectively. So is there a way to do multilateralism without falling into this kind of globalist, uh, feeding this globalist or uh, anti-globalist uh, argument? I think first we need to recognize that um, this is not only about the Trump administration, uh, that there were uh, uh, hints of this trend uh, before uh, Trump came to the White House, but also because it's not just uh, about the US. More generally, there is winning appetite for multilateral cooperation, and that's including uh, in the EU. Uh, and outside of the EU, you can, uh, it's not very hard to meet with uh, doubts on how universalist uh, the multilateral system is. And that's the case both uh, from uh, the political uh, perspective, where people will say behind this kind of uh, multilateral appearance, actually this is uh, Western hegemony, uh, but also culturally. It's not just Western hegemony in terms of uh, those who are in power, but it's also Western hegemony in terms of your trying to impose your interpretation of what is the right uh, norms, uh, etc. For instance, um, on free trade, uh, go to any Latin American <laughs> embassies and they will tell you that you are the, you, the West is for free trade except on agriculture, for instance. Um, and, and last, one of the issues has to do with the uh, ineffectiveness of multilateral policies that we need to recognize. I think the multilateral system is at best good at crisis management, not always so good, but it's doing what it can. It certainly is not that good at crisis prevention and at uh, addressing long-term uh, challenges. And um, you mentioned globalization in the introduction, and certainly there has, has been, it, the system has been quite unresponsive at addressing people's concerns with globalization, especially on the economic front, even uh, if not only on the economic front. So what do we do uh, in front of this? I, there is a temptation, because that's such a big challenge, there is temptation to confuse defense of, of multilateralism with defense of the status quo. Uh, the idea that it's going to be very hard, at least let's keep what we have uh, already. And I think this is not going to do it, precisely because of these uh, issues of uh, how the system is not effective enough and not responsive enough. Of course, it's of the utmost importance to keep the climate deal working, uh, to keep Iran in the Iran nuclear deal and abiding by its commitments to keep uh, to find more funding for the UN uh, when it's deprived of uh, funding, for instance, on uh, humanitarian affairs. But there's a need for more reform. There's a need for uh, different uh, policies on trade, on uh, refugees, on climate uh, that uh, step up to the plate uh, given the uh, what we know of the challenges. And there's a need for institutional reforms. We've mentioned the WTO, there clearly is a need for a reform of the dispute uh, settlement uh, mechanism. Uh, 
the UN Security Council, which is a good example of, uh, in some cases, a deadlocked institution. So the reform should not be just about membership. It could be also about veto. The uh, Bretton Woods Institution is another case. It was striking how China moved to the Asian, to create the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank after the US Congress deprived China of the reform um, of the uh, Bretton Woods uh, uh, governing uh, bodies. There's also a need to move towards uh, more uh, uh, work with non-state actors. Uh, this is something that, for instance, the, the French presidency of the G7 is insisting a lot in terms of uh, uh, digital uh, economy. Um, there are discussion on how to deal with uh, um, digital platforms, but on climate I think it's a very good uh, other example where one way to uh, counteract uh, after the US withdrew from the Paris uh, deal was to work with foundations, local governments, big companies, unions, uh, from the US and therefore keep the US uh, actors more or less on track even if the federal government was actually not uh, willing to abide by its commitment under the, the Paris uh, deal. Um, and that is my last point. There is uh, uh, clearly a need to build a more uh, democratic uh, way to do foreign policy. I think uh, what happened with the Marrakesh Compact on Migration, which was uh, known uh, by uh, everyone to be uh, negotiated for uh, uh, months and even years, and which ended up in a few weeks uh, in the kind of total mess up that it was, is a good example that uh, we need to deal with these issues quite differently, not only at the multilateral <laughs> level, not only at the European level, but also probably at the national level. Thank you. Thank you.